I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined today's conversation with the Emerging Scholars Network. Uh, my name is Bob Truby, and I serve as the National Director of the Emerging Scholars Network, which is a ministry equipping and encouraging developing scholars who follow Jesus together. I don't know if there's a discipline in the university nor an aspect in university life or even wider life in which the dignity of persons does not matter. It's a central concern in courses from on literary theory and philosophy, at the same time in everything from sexual ethics to the development of technology to economics. We face the danger of people being dehumanized, treated as cogs or units or objects. Paul Lewis Metzger has written what I believe to be quite an important book on the idea of personalism and how this bears on every aspect of life in utero, from life in utero all the way to our exploration of space. And we're going to get into all of those things in the course of our conversation together. But before we begin, let me just take care of a few housekeeping details for us, uh, and then we'll get into the conversation. Uh, we are recording today's conversation, and if you would prefer not to be recorded uh, or photographed, uh, please keep your mic muted and disable your video. By continuing to participate in the conversation with your video and or audio enabled after the re recording begins, you can send to allow InterVarsity to use our recording and any screenshots of the conversation for InterVarsity ministry purposes. I'll stop, I'll pause our recording now to allow you to disable your video and audio if you would prefer not to be recorded. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Paul Lewis Metzger to all of you today. And uh, uh, Paul is, has a PhD from King's College uh, in London. He's a professor of Christian theology and the Theology of Culture at Multnomah, Multnomah University uh, and Seminary. And he's the director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins, which you can see in his background there. He's the author of numerous books, including Consuming Jesus, Beyond Race and Class Divisions in a Consumer Church, and Connecting Christ, How to Discuss Jesus in a World of Diverse Paths. And he's the co-editor of World for All, Global Civil Society in Political Theory and Trinitarian Theology. He's also written a commentary on the Gospel of John for University Press. So, Paul, it's great to have you with us, and uh, I'm looking forward to jumping into it with you. Yeah, thanks so much, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here with you and our other uh, contributors in the dialogue that we'll have with Q&A. So many thanks for this opportunity. Well, thank you for taking the time. I know it's, it's the beginning of a semester, and so I'm sure, and and you've launched a book, and so your life has to be pretty full these days. It's good though. Yeah, keeps yeah. me out of trouble. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, when I, I when I was looking at your biography, you one of the things you mentioned is this Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine and New Wine Skins, and we have that up on your background here. And it seems to me that that's connected in 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 many ways this idea of cultural engagement. Uh, with your book. And so I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about the, the Institute and the connection to what you're writing about in More Than Things. Thank you, Bob. So uh, the, the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins, started up in the year 2000. It was my uh, the, the year uh, right after I started at Multnomah University and Seminary. And uh, at first it was a, a program at the university and seminary, and now it's uh, completely independent as its own nonprofit. And uh, uh, the thrust of New Wine, if we could use our tagline here, is building relational bridges through Jesus. It's through the triune God, you know, in and through Christ and the Spirit uh, in contemporary culture and especially in a polarized culture. And so New Wine is about seeking to build those relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. We engage from a Trinitarian framework. Uh, conflict transformation is you know, really core to what we're dealing with in issues of equity and diversity, matters of uh, faith and science, matters of religious pluralism, uh, disability discussions, mental health, uh, the public square more broadly, uh, and the list goes on. But it's really from that vantage point of building those relational bridges. And 
you know, it's it started out in Portland, though we're beyond Portland, where uh, our leadership team is uh, and representatives are across uh, parts of the country and uh, even into Canada. And we we hope for that being beyond national borders, et cetera, as we proceed. But just the last point I'll make on that uh, is that, you know, we started in Stumptown or Bridgetown. Uh, Portland is known as Bridgetown or Stumptown. And so uh, with all the bridges here, it, it makes me think all the more about that. So that's a that's a key aspect. And we have a journal, Cultural Encounters, a journal for the theology of culture. And so we're excited about uh, moving forward uh, as a nonprofit, especially in a polarized society and how through Jesus to build relational bridges. Great, great. And um, if people want to get in touch with you online or whatever uh, uh, with the Institute, how would they get a hold of you? Well, uh, they can find information for contact at new-wineskins.org, new-wineskins.org. Uh, they could certainly also reach out to me. Uh, they, you know, they can find my email address at Multnoma. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I would encourage them to go to the website, new-wineskins.org, to find out more about the Institute and the like. And we're, we're breaking new ground right now, a lot of times with local churches, parachurch organizations, but we work even more broadly than Christian circles, shall we say. Well, that's great to know about. Well, hey, your book is about personalism. Uh, the, it's titled More Than Things, and uh, the subtitle is A Personalist Ethics for a Throwaway Culture. And so I wonder if you might just give us a brief introduction to the sort of the philosophical, theological framework of personalism. You know, what is personalism, as it were? Uh, thank you, Bob. So uh, personalism uh, can be found in a variety of contexts, not just the Christian context. One can find it in Eastern thought forms as well, but certainly in the Judeo-Christian context and certain philosophical movements uh, beyond Christianity. Uh, so it's it's not simply within the Christian domain. And so first, I'm going to start out with a broader definition that I think uh, draws together many trajectories of personalism. Uh, personalism will account for our embodied selves. So embodiment is, is a core part of personalism as I'm thinking of it. Uh, Christian Smith and his phenomenal work in sociology, What is a Person, uh, emphasizes at great length that theme of embodiment. So it involves our embodiment. Uh, it involves consciousness. It involves self-consciousness, uh, human agency, uh, and autonomy, not in an individualistic sense, because the other aspect to it that complements it is that it's it's also relationally framed. We're not individuals in isolation but persons in communion is how I'd wish to articulate it. Uh, as I move into the, the Christian sphere, uh, the Judeo-Christian sphere, it certainly involves the vertical dimension of loving God with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbors ourselves, creating the image of the triune God from a Christian vantage point, and to love our neighbors ourselves. So it involves that individual agency, but also that corporate sense of identity that we're not islands unto ourselves. So those are some of the key aspects of personalism, there's a lot more to it, but I hope that that at least gets us going at the outset. Yeah. You know, I might just follow up uh, and ask you a little bit about, you, you talk about this Trinitarian basis of personalism that is kind of a unique contribution that you're making. I wonder if you might say a little bit more about how you think the Trinity is really important to uh, how you frame personalism. Uh, so in terms of the Trinitarian uh, discussion, uh, you know, from the early church's vantage point, even looking at the Imago Dei in Genesis 1, let us make man in our own image, in the image of God, God created man, male and female. Uh, there was a sense in which uh, a divine plurality, and by the way, we have uh, someone not muted here. Um, yeah, in, if, if here somebody else is on who doesn't have your mic muted, could you do that, please? Uh, thank you. So uh, again, from the vantage point of uh, Genesis 1, there are figures in the history of the church going way back where they would account for that plurality in Genesis 1, where, you know, it's it's not simply a royal we. Uh, it, it, it doesn't appear to be that God is speaking to the angels, let us make man or let us make humanity. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's a plurality, so to speak, and this is something that Karl Barth, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer make note of uh, in terms of their relational ontology or way of looking at uh, being. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think, uh, engaged it before Bart, and that is that again we see a duality or you know even a plurality in the human uh, um, the human domain that let us make man in our own image the image of God God created man male and female so it's not just a man woman thing uh, but that's indicative of a larger reality that the image has a plurality to it of mutuality on the human level but also in relationship to God. Uh, Hansers von Boltzar, the great Roman Catholic theologian, maintains that personalism really finds, at least in the West, its grounding, uh, specific grounding or basis for current thought by way of patristic theology in terms of Trinitarian discourse, uh, that we have this emphasis in Trinitarian theology that when we talk about God, we must talk about God as one and three at the same time, for example, the Cappadocians. And that, you know, the persons are not add-ons. It's not like in modalism where, uh, with modalism, that God has mass. And sometimes God appears as the Father. Uh, God appears as the Son. God appears as the Spirit. Uh, that that idea, what's called modalism, uh, suggests that personhood and particularity like that does not go to the core of God's being. It's, in a sense, an add-on. But Trinitarian thought indicates that we cannot think of essence apart from person so that yes god is one essentially but yet also personhood goes to the core of god's being just as much as god's essence does so uh that was key other figures one of my professors john zulis and while some of his thoughts been criticized i think that he and my own mentor colin gunton uh have some uh, ideas well mm -hmm. worth consideration in this regard um, and i make note of this but I'll just say this, that, um, you know, from Zazula's vantage point and others, that it was only when you get to Trinitarian thought in the patristic period that you really move beyond seeing prosopon, um, which was often seen as mask on the Greek theater stage, that the actor would put on toward catharsis in the Greek tragedy to move beyond the fates. It's only when you move into understanding that the prosopon is not a mask, but a person with Trinitarian thought that that births a true personalistic thrust that we see moving forward, even into the 20th century, and especially arising with even more gusto, shall we say, in the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Boston School, certain kind of personalism there, mm -hmm. and John Paul II uh, in his own work as a personalist. And those are two of the most uh, significant personalist uh, thought leaders in the 20th century. Well, you know, you've been talking about a lot of the, the the Christian sources from early church history up to the present that you interact with in your book. I, I, you also um, interact with a number of others, uh, Confucius and Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, uh, Muhammad Gandhi, the Dalai Lama, Karen Armstrong, Charles Darwin, and even Richard Dawkins. Uh, in the course of and, uh, and the list goes text. on and the list goes and the on. list goes on it's a lot longer list uh, uh, I wonder if you might explain uh, you know most a lot of Christian books and even a lot of serious books I just see primarily are act, interacting with other Christian sources you work a lot more widely on this and I wonder if you might explain some of why you took that approach in writing the book. Okay, I could I could quote the kind of Lutheran line, you know, if I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin boldly. So, you know, I'm going to go outside the lanes and engage broadly, but, you know, with hopefully a, a deep core that centers me. So I'm just, I'm bantering there, Bob. Yep, you, but, certainly, uh, did, you, you certainly did that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> sin boldly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that said, um, when I think of even my own story, my own family story, uh, my wife is... Uh, Japanese. Uh, she's from Japan. Uh, and uh, we've lived in Japan. And I was fascinated uh, with the Japanese culture. Uh, we thought we'd end up there long term. And uh, I had the privilege of engaging Buddhist thought forms and Shinto thought forms uh, in Japan. And it really made a deep impression on me how to contextualize the gospel in a way that's not at all triumphalist, but embedded in the thought forms of any given culture, not just that culture, but any given culture. 
And so that's been with me a long, long time. Um, and uh, that's carried over into all my work with New Wine, New Wineskins. As I said before, we engage on religious pluralism. I'm working on a new book for InterVarsity on engaging uh, religion, the concept of religion um, that was just contracted. And so it's a passion of mine that goes back many years. And I work a lot with Zen Buddhists. For example, we've been working with the Zen Buddhist community in Portland since like 2005. Uh, some of my deepest relationships are engaging people of very diverse traditions. That's just one example. But uh, I think it's important for Christians uh, to engage our pluralistic society well. And I'm trying hard to do that. Whether I do it well or not is another question. But I think the Apostle Paul and the other ap apostles were living in a very pluralistic society. They weren't threatened by it. Uh, they weren't seeking, again, this is an anachronism, okay, but they, mm -hmm. they weren't seeking to aspire to Christian nationalism as if that could have even happened in the Roman Empire. But it, it was like they were well-versed in that. And so much of the scripture is not about Elijah with the prophets of Baal, but it's like Daniel and his friends in the Babylonian context in exile having to navigate a pluralistic world. And so that's a deep passion of mine as well as New Wine, New Wine Skins and the teaching I do at Multnomah University with my class on world religions. Well, I, you know, I, I thought that was one of the compelling and interesting aspects of your book personally, because um, it was just a much thicker account of, of personalism and, and, and an ethic that is not peculiar to Christians, but certainly one that we could embrace in common conversations uh, with a variety of others. Uh, and if you don't mind me interjecting further, Bob, uh, just on this point, I think it's important, you know, to find friends in unique places. Yeah. Uh, and so like the Dalai Lama in chapter three or not chapter three, chapter four, engaging genetic engineering, I think, uh, you know, uh, certain papal figures would resonate with some of his core concerns on genetic engineering and the like. And so he holds to the sacredness of all life, and that's going to make a difference. So, of course, there are major differences between the respective traditions, and we don't want to discount that for a variety of reasons. But uh, if we're going to be living in a pluralistic world, we have to engage it graciously and truthfully, which, of course, is embedded in the person of Jesus Christ. And none of us can get quite at that balance, erring more toward truth or grace. But how to do both together well, we need the spirit. <laughs> well, um, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, before we get into some of the particular issues, you know, the, the first part of the book really lays out kind of a, a personalist framework, and then you really begin to bring that to bear on a number of issues. Um, uh, the second part of the book focuses on issues around life from the beginning to the end, and the third part, more about issues of the world and society, uh, uh, going all the way from just our own homes to uh, uh, space exploration. And uh, but before we touch on that, personalism has become very personal for you, too. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might just share existentially a little bit about um, how personalism has come home to you in terms of the care of your son. Yes, thank you, Bob. So in January 2021, uh, my son, Chris, who is 27, now endured a catastrophic brain injury. It wasn't your typical TBI. And uh, he is still in a minimally conscious state. Uh, you know, I don't know to what extent you would call it minimal and, you know, where it's progressing and such. It's always hard to discern those uh, mm -hmm. matters. But he's completely dependent on others' care, including our own. Uh, but, you know, I was struck in the early days when he was at the resident care facility after the brain surgery and all that transpired there. I remember one of the, the caregivers, the leaders at his care facility saying, you know, even though it's hot in the summer and while he has an air conditioner, it can still be hot in the rooms at times. She said, we definitely want to have a sheet over him. So he's not just exposed with his brief, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to affirm his dignity. And I was struck by that because I don't know what this particular individual's vantage point is, call it a worldview. Um, I never get the sense that this person is per se operating from a Christian vantage point, but I think it's instinctive. I think it's instinctive. And as I think Barbara Johnson, the great literary critic, gets at, you know, basically none of us want to be treated as a thing, but it's hard to treat one another as persons. 
And, you know, I was just appreciative of her treating my son as a person with what I'd call inherent dignity, regardless of the state of his brain. So to me, consciousness, yes. I talked about self-consciousness, yes, for personhood. But what about the person in the minimally conscious brain state mm -hmm. and the like? And he has dignity. He's not an automaton, uh, nor is someone who's in a coma. I mean, they're not automatons, but, you know, my son is a person with all the inherent dignity that entails. So it was a baptism with fire here. I've been working on this book for 13 years um, uh, since its publication. But, you know, I was working on major revisions for the book that were much needed um, moving forward. And it was right after that, I thought, how in the world am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to get these important revisions done? But it was actually catalytic and it was centering and it gave me a focus hmm. uh, with a laser beam lens, so to speak. Um, and so, but, you know, I trade like everything. This to stuff have really matters. Yeah, that, I, I trade everything to have Christopher back in the way he was, you know, mm -hmm. um, in so many ways. But he influences me. Uh, he influences my writing in so many ways. And uh, so just, you know, in, in addressing this matter, Bob, and thank you for asking it, it, it shapes it shapes so much of my thinking and writing, um, hopefully the rest of my life. And uh, I'm grateful for my son's influence on me today. Hmm. We're thankful for him and the, the role mm -hmm. that he has in your life and the, the, the worth and value he has and the, the gifts that he brings to our, you know, God's people and mm -hmm. that he still does, you know, that. I think that's one of the things that uh, you capture is just uh, this sense of of, of community uh, among mm -hmm. all uh, of people and particularly among God's people. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk with you about was, uh, you know, it, you, you, know, you write in your book about sexual ethics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and this is certainly an area that's uh, a, a fraught and contentious area in the university world. Um, you know, it's a it's a world that's dominated by expressive individualism, uh, in which my own desires and sense of identity of what's right, uh, uh, with a framework of mutual consent with similarly desiring individuals that that kind of is the ethic that that goes. It's like you do you is the basic word. Um, how is a personalist sexual ethic different, and mm -hmm. and what? how might we make the case for that in a very pluralist kind of situation? Now, thank you, Bob. I appreciate this question very much. And, you know, in the context of InterVarsity's work, uh, which you uh, represent and you're thinking constantly about, you're navigating these matters front yeah. and center. It's, it's a daily reality of how do we engage in a thoughtful, truthful, gracious way, you know, from a biblical vantage point. So it's uh, it's so important. And so, you know, I, I did an art, a talk once at Oregon State uh, uh, for a, it was, it was a Christian conference, but it was in the, in their sports uh, uh, center in the, where the basketball team plays and such. And it was on the matter, I was engaging the subject as casual sex. And I thought, you know, casual sex or friendship with benefits or, you know, dot, dot, dot. Listen, I was just fascinated with the terminology. And so I've been thinking about it ever since. That was years ago. And how to articulate these matters. Um, I actually like how Immanuel Kant talks about personhood with his categorical imperative. I, I mean, I think he's influenced mm -hmm. by his parents' Lutheran pietist background. He might not think he is at that juncture because he always wants to operate as a rationalist. But one form of his categorical imperative that I make use of in the book is that we must never treat someone as a mere means, but as an end in themselves mm -hmm. and a personalist. And he has instincts that are personalist in orientation, a personalist vantage point seeks to guard against treating people as mere means and seeing them as ends in themselves, that people are inviolable in their uh, identity, they're unfathomable as mysteries, they're unrepeatable as individual persons. That's all part of my particular definition of personhood and with dignity. And so I must not treat people as an object for, you know, whether it's about sexual pleasure um, as the focal point, it has to be embedded in a larger social reality, both in terms of the the, the parties involved, and let's say children, uh, let's say the community at large, because we're not islands unto ourselves, as I said before, we're not autonomous individuals, where the focus is simply on how it benefits me. That's not a personalist orientation. And so, um, you know, I can go further on this, how I would engage in a, in a university context, a pluralist university context, if you wish. 
Well, I wonder if I can actually take you uh, on to my, another question that is connected, but, and there's also a lot of concern in the university world around uh, gender equality, uh, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a lot of pushback that's occurring these days around those things as well. Uh, and I, what I'm wondering is, is there something that personalist ethics offer as an alternative to Me Too and Black Lives Matter on one hand and the anti-wokeism uh, uh, on the other? Thank you, Bob. You know, if, if you've seen the movie Crash, uh, I, I find that movie on, which deals with racism in LA, as one colleague of mine at a local university years ago said, um, that really the movie's about objectification and fragmentation in our society, that racism really reflects that mm -hmm. uh, objectification and uh, fragmentation. And what one finds in the movie, if, if we're thinking about it from a personalist vantage point, even though it's not framed by way of personalism, each of these individuals that are crashing into one, there's Don Chidi's character says, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in LA, we're always behind this metal and glass. He says that at the outset of the movie. We're always behind this metal and glass, and we miss that sense of touch so much that we crash into one another just to have some kind of connection. Uh, and so I think that with each person, we can we can tend to think of those driving down the road that they're not really persons. They're behind metal and glass. We're behind metal and glass as we drive down the road in society. And I need to see that the other, not to other the other, but that that individual person has a story. And in the movie Crash, what you often find is that even when people are crashing into one another, if we only knew the stories behind them, we might understand why we crash. So, you know, I think uh, what you find often by way, language of wokeism, you know, that was a good word to be woke, was a good word historically in the context to be enlightened, to be awake, awakened on racial prejudice and racism. Um, but it's been turned into a, a swear word in certain circles, in my estimation. Um, and I think that if someone is critical of and say, well, we're a post-racialized society, which I completely disagree with, we're not a post-racialized society, as Smith, Christian Smith and Michael Emerson say in the, the well-known book, Divided by Faith, is that race operates by way of variables, not constants. So it's constantly evolving. So that said, um, you know, I struggle when people think we're post-racialized, but I have to still engage whoever is my dialogue partner in terms of their embeddedness in their stories. And why is it that any of us think the way we do? That's what personalism brings to it. And MLK always saw it in his public discourse, which was about public discourse. It wasn't Twitter feeds where it's just mic drop moments. He was about sustained argumentation embedded in community. And he operated by way of a personalist orientation. We need to move from a culture of things to persons. And he saw the other never ultimately as his enemy, but as someone he would long to be a friend with in terms of the beloved community. Mm. And so his personalism was so much front and center in the sermon, his Christmas sermon, just a few months before his death, where he said to the white oppressor, he said, though you bomb our homes, and his home was bombed, though you uh, kill our children, Though you keep coming after us, we are going to win this civil rights battle. But when we win it, we're going to win you over in the process. So it's a double victory because we're moving together forward. And his idea of the beloved community is a powerful notion of how to move forward in a way that we bring that future into the present. And it was all from that vantage point of seeing mm -hmm. the other, not as a thing, but as a person. So I think knowing people's stories is part of what we need to do. Why do people react the way they do? Why do I react the way I do? How do we get to know one another? And as Atticus Finch said, it's a well-known statement. We all know it, but I think it's still true. If you really want to understand someone, you have to step inside their shoes and see things from their vantage point. And that is so critically important. And the incarnation is the ultimate embedding and embeddedness in shoes. Uh, mm -hmm. Christ coming, as Eugene Peter said, Moon, Peterson says, to move into our neighborhood. He doesn't crash. He doesn't crash into us. He doesn't do drive by. He shares his life with us. Yeah. He, he the buys sense a of house touch. in the neighborhood, as it were. And yeah, the living. sense of the touch, the sense yeah. of touch that Jesus does as he engages people. That's what's needed. And personalism is about that. Excellent. And that sounds like a good place to take a break. Uh, we're going to uh, 
uh, just let people know how they can get your book, and then we'll uh, move into audience Q&A. So those of you who have questions, if you want to get those into the chat, we've already put the information in the chat uh, about Paul's book, but uh, here's what we're talking about and, uh, and how you can get that. Uh, let me move ahead a slide or so. Okay, yeah. The, so the book we're talking about is More Than Things. Great cover there. Uh, the, and you can get that at InterVarsity Press, uh, ivypress.com slash more than things. Uh, and if you go to that website and use the code IVPESN25 until September 21st, you can get a 25% discount on the book with free shipping. And so uh, uh, we'd love for you to pick up a copy if you don't already have one. Well, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, open things to audience q and I don't see anything yet in the chat. So while we're doing that, I, uh, you know, one of the things we didn't get to, I, uh, you, uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of ESN folks are Trekkies. They're, you know, we, we geek on science fiction and things like that. And uh, you have a chapter on uh, personalism in, in the final frontier in space exploration. And, uh, I wondered, I wonder how you take personalism to where no human has gone before. <laughs> uh, so, you know, two of the aspects that I, I seek to engage both in the book and then also in the study guide, there's a free downloadable study guide available now at the webpage, uh, IVP. It's about 75 pages for individuals, small groups, and class classes taking years to write that too with help from some friends and uh but two of the things that stand out to me is what i'm engaging one is often space exploration i'm all for space exploration but often space exploration is today at times a secular person's eschatology or study of last things you know the way stephen hawking elon musk others talk about space exploration it can almost be like you know, we need to leave this world behind. It's not uh, the rapture kind of idea of, you know, not getting left behind, but it's there is a secular form of it, not to heaven, shall we say, or the new heavens and new earth, but to another planet, shall we say. And there's this alternative um, eschatology or study of last things that I find, which was fascinating to me. And then the other aspect is, and I, I seek to engage it, is it's it's a heuristic device. If we were to think through a lot of the themes of the book i bring them home many of them in that chapter you know if we only had 100 people that we could send into space who would the 100 people be what shall we say demographics would they represent would it only be the elon musk uh the neil degrasse tysons the stephen hawkins the gordon geckos etc 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 would we include people in a minimally conscious state, people with autism or Down syndrome, would we inca would we include people who are poor, um, et cetera, et cetera? I get you know men and women, boys and girls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, the list goes on. And I asked students at the at the university, if you only had a hundred people that could go off in that ship, who would go? And it, it really tells us a lot about ourselves. Just like astrobiology and astrophysics can tell us a lot about physics and biology here so there's a there's a need there we learn a lot in so many ways from being out there we learn a lot about space exploration for ethics and uh in in what's required there so uh that's a key aspect of it and then one other aspect i'll just draw attention to if you don't mind bob uh in the historiography that's often played out especially with sigmund freud for example uh neil degrasse tyson gets at this in batman versus superman too is that Post Copernicus, uh, humanity is not all that important, shall we say? And that's how Freud reads it. You know, he says Copernicus, Darwin, and his own psychoanalysis theory displace humanity. We're aliens in the universe. We're insecure, etc. We don't count that much. That's hardly the case for Copernicus. And I think one can make a case that Darwin wouldn't see it that way either, regardless of Freud. But with Copernicus, humanity was never. It's not about in scripture, for example, that the earth had to be the center of the universe. Psalm 8 is not about uh, the world being at the center of the universe. It's that humans are at the center of God's affection. So it doesn't matter how mm. big we are, 
how significant we are in the world. It's all about God's mercy and grace. And the psalmist is taken up by that. And Hebrews 2 picks up on that and that we still, but now we see Jesus. So I think that space exploration, how we go about the historiography that led us here in some ways that we're displaced, we're aliens in the universe. No, it, it calls us to recount um, a need for a greater, more beautiful aesthetic, uh, a reframing of historiography uh, that really does see the person as central because only as the person is central are we secure to treat one another and the world and the universe, multiverse, in a way that really affirms mutual well-being. So I can say more, but that, that's an aspect of it. Okay, uh, we have a question from Ron here. Um, Hello, Ron. Ron says, uh, Paul, how do we as a community of faith encourage others to tell their story and listen, come alongside as a family of faith? Stories that uh, that may or may not affirm our own worldview or persons mm. of faith who are fearful of relating their authentic self. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah. so Excellent. much of it is how do we really help people become free and share in their stories? Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, Ron. And so, uh, as I said, you know, I work a lot with Zen Buddhists, and we do potlucks. And it was actually the Zen Buddhist uh, priest that I worked with. We did a book together, Evangelical Zen, years ago. He passed away of a massive heart attack. But he invited me and some of my students from Multnomah, New Wine, to come and share about compassion from a Christian vantage point at a time when they weren't sensing much compassion from the evangelical community in Portland and elsewhere, back in 2004, 2005, on a variety of social issues, et cetera. And I thought it was so amazing. And it cost him something because he was inviting us there on site when they were so struggling with us generally, and then bring us into his space. And he asked me to share, asked us to share. And, but it was at a potluck where everyone brings a dish to share. It wasn't a platform. It was a potluck around tables. And we've been practicing that ever since with monthly potlucks where each person brings a dish to share. As Sally Tisdale, a famous uh, author who's a leader at the community, wrote an article for Tricycle Magazine about our work, Beloved Community. She said, the evangelicals and Buddhists couldn't believe it. You like noodle salad? We like noodle salad. <laughs> they couldn't believe that evangelicals actually were smarter than they thought. And we thought that they were funnier than we thought. But it was all because it was an open conversation. And since that time, Besides going through our struggles with one another's traditions and metaphysical differences on Jesus and Buddha and lifestyle choices, et cetera, et cetera, culturally, sexually, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, we've talked about doubts. You know, do we ever experience doubt in our tradition? Mm. And, uh, and that's been life-giving. Wow. I feel that Christians need to learn to express openly those things. And by the way, even in my son's situation, some of the people who come closest to us in the midst of us has been people in the midst of everything have been people, yes, in the church, thank God for the church, and also people from these other communities. And shared suffering has a way of drawing people together. Openness about suffering can be very redemptive and healing. And it brings us together where most other things don't because Christian triumphalism doesn't really give that kind of space for people to um, really sense that we are human mm. um, and, and we can be non-threatening. And I think that uh, that's key. It's not just what Henry Nouwen would say for the Christian community, but you know, taking pain to such a level that it can be shared. And that needs to be done on faith issues, on struggles generally, and it opens the door for really profound engagement. And I think robust Christian witness, while not doing it in a bait and switch way, in a way that's truly dialogical. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that was a great George, question. Yeah. Uh, George, who is actually an old friend, uh, it's great to have you on the call today, George, Hello, George. Uh, asks this question. Um, Remembrance of Earth's Past is a sci-fi trilogy by, I, I'll get the name wrong, Sixen Liu. Uh, the Three-Body Problem is the first well-known book. Uh, from the point of view of a Christian worldview, that was an extremely interesting series. The way the author views the universe with a sense of foreboding was saddening. Any thoughts? How the author viewed the universe at large presently or in the future? I, I'm not familiar with the trilogy. I'll have to read it. Thank you, George. Uh, was it was it in terms of the present or the future? And George, if you want to unmute to kind of um, 
explain the question a little bit. You're welcome to do sure. that. Sure, I can do that. Um, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for this talk, by the way. Um, the way that the book, it, the author at least, views the uh, the universe is like very antagonistic. Um, that if you as a species ever decide to, uh, you know, go out and explore the universe, um, that other more um, uh, powerful species will squash you down and destroy you because they don't know how to deal. Um, they don't know how to collaborate. They don't know how to in engage with one another. They only know how to kill one another. And that's why, um, you know, from one sense of view, we don't see too much alien species. We don't mm -hmm. see alien species at all because a lot of the times that that uh, that engagement has happened and they have destroyed one another. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very interesting uh, worldview. Um, but, man, I mean, he takes it to the nth degree, though. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, back to the yeah. Thank you, George, for the clarification. My, my best. It's actually coming to... out as a series, by the way, in case oh. that's something. Yep. Yeah, wonderful. I'll, I'll I'll definitely check that out. Thank you. Uh, so you know, my own, you know, attempt at a response to a you know a significant question and no doubt a, a significant series, um, is that you know again back to the point of Copernicus and the sense of alienation, human alienation in the world is a key theme in modernity in the present context, I think when humanity sees itself as alienated, we become more dangerous. Uh, when And I think it's um, the great uh, science fiction author, Ray Bradbury, who gets at some of this in the Martian Chronicles. And, and yet when, so our fear of the other, and here in this context, those from other worlds, it actually makes us more imposing, more dangerous. Uh, so I think, you know, just I come back to the point of persons when we sense that we're secure in the universe in relationship to God and one another, it causes us not to take matters into our own hands. And I talk a lot about the need for decentering a decentered deity, a decentered humanity, and a decentered cosmos. Uh, not that we lose sight of God, but the incarnation is all about, you know, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but poured himself out. It's not to seize, it's not to control, it's not to grasp, but it's to operate in a way that was really life sharing. And so I think I think that that theme of alienation that's so present when we feel alienated, that's where this becomes an issue. And it's, it's also that with environmental studies. I'm doing an article for a, a journal on uh, sustainability in British Columbia and one of the arguments from Peter Harrison in his critique of Lynn White's thesis on uh, Christianity being at the core of the environmental crisis, he said, actually, it was only when modernity came about with this idea that we're displaced, that ideologically, mo moderns ideologically moved toward uh, controlling, oppressing nature. It was not ideologically, practically, pragmatically it happened at many times, but it wasn't ideologically the case. But humanity decentered on earth, losing its sense of placement before God, leads it to threat in others. And I think that would be the case with outer space exploration as well. Ray Bradbury puts it that we're the dangerous ones. And I think C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. in his space trilogy makes a similar point. That's great. Great question, George. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, one of the things I we didn't do is uh, we... Uh, we didn't touch on the different issues that you touch on in parts two and three of your book. Would you just kind of give us a, a quick uh, overview of the different uh, things that you cover so that people know what you're getting into? Yes, after I lay the foundations, chapter one and two, with uh, why I go about the way I'm going about it in this particular book, um, I get into, call them case studies, if you will, um, the chapters are really explorations in personalism uh, contextualized to various social ethical issues. So chapter three deals with uh, um, abortion and what is often called disabilities. Uh, then I go into genetic engineering. Uh, then I go into sexual expression. Then I go into gender. Uh, then I go into end of life care. So the beginning of life to end of life, as Bob so helpfully put it, earlier uh, in this hour. And then the, the next major section, the third major section of the book uh, is where I explore it more on a, a national and global scale. So I go from racial prejudice, racism, racialization, 
chapter eight, uh, closer to home, shall we say, in America. Then I go into the issue of immigration reform. So going, in a sense, even beyond our borders. Then I go into drone warfare, environmental considerations, and then space exploration, the last ethical frontier. Before I sum it up with uh, engagement of where do we go next with personalism, uh, such matters as weight of glory with Lewis and company about aesthetics is key. A sense of a more beautiful orientation, I think personalism is very robust mm. as moving toward an aesthetic for the common good of truth, goodness, and beauty. Excellent. Well, um, uh, we have time for maybe one more question if somebody wants to get something in there. Not seeing anything. I'm going to go ahead and throw one out. Um, what word would you have for the church from your perspective? Is, are there some challenges that you think that the church faces in terms of treating people as more than things? Uh, thank you, Bob. I think, you know, in, in the book, it's woven in in different contexts. Uh, and, you know, I think Christian nationalism in the American context is mm -hmm. is very much of a, of a concern to me. Uh, I think also the matter of, you know, taking it more because and I think that bears on immigration reform of othering the refugee and the migrant. You know, I get into all that in the book. I think, you know, if we talk about even in terms of church practice and, you know, as a Christian, I, you know, the church is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to cherish the local church. Uh, and I think because we should cherish the local church and the church more broadly, we need to be critical, though, in a constructive way in favor of Christian personalism in the church. So here it is. I'm very concerned about language where Christians easily and in leadership circles can easily frame their congregations by way of giving units. That's commodification. Uh, now, I mm -hmm. understand leaders face all kinds of pressures with paying bills and such. Uh, I think performer spectator language, audience uh, language, um, that all plays to it. Significant leader, significant church. Uh, it reminds me of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, where some have greater significance than others, and Paul kind of turns that on its head. So these are just different areas where I see this in play with disabilities. How seldom do we look at people with, call it disabilities, alternative abilities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's not a once, you know, once for all agreed term here, but the idea, both in the culture large in the church, to get beyond ableism and see that, you know, it's not simply to invite people, but that people belong, that people are not simply invited, but they have as much belonging as I do, and we need one another. As a friend of mine said in one of our new wine conferences, you know, that which is seen as less significant, Paul talks about this. They're indispensable. They're not dispensable. And the cover of the book talks about, you know, people are reduced to these plastic cutouts and their tools and they have use, but only as long as they're useful. In a book exploring ecclesiology for Brazos Baker, I got at this too with my colleague, Brad Harper, instead of purpose-driven and activity-driven church, and that's, those are important, even deeper is being driven, uh, that, that we are who we are in relation and we need to start asking ourselves first, not so what do you do, but who are you in relation? Like, tell me about your story. And we tend to focus mm. more about what we do than who we are in relation. It's indigenous cultures where I often find the story framed by way of their family story and their community story. And I can learn from that a lot. Well, hey, it's kind of come uh, time for us to give you the last word. Maybe that was already it. But if you have anything else that you'd like to leave us with as a challenge, as a thought, uh, in terms of what you've written, I'd love to love to give you a chance to give us your parting shot. Well, thank you, Bob. And I just want to say thank you to each person here and for those who will be um, watching this later, that um, I would just want us all to know that no matter what we're going through in life, I take very seriously, more and more so, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And I think the more we experience that secure attachment in relationship to the triune God, that the Father is, Pastor Avery Stafford puts it so well, the Father is for us, the Son is with us, and the Spirit is in us. 
as we experience that mm. secure attachment, what Paul says in Romans 8, I think it helps us to treat one another more, not as things, but as persons. And so that security is what we desperately need. And as Tim Keller, I think, said, we already have a security. We already are known. We don't have to go and find our significance and worth. And the more we realize that, the more we can treat one another as persons, not as things. It's a great last word. Paul, thank you so much for thank you, Bob. Uh, being Thanks part to of everyone. this com conversation today. And you've given us some really good things to, uh, to think about. Uh, we're going to put the information in the chat once more about uh, Paul's book. Uh, and uh, we'll just uh, uh, give a quick share of that. Uh, the uh, Paul's book is More Than Things. Uh, and it's available at InterVarsity Press, uh, ivypress.com, more than things. And that uh, web link is in the chat. And if you use the code IVPESN2025 until September 21st, you can get a 25% discount on the book with free shipping. So we hope uh, you'll pick up, pick the book up. It'll, it will be one that you... Uh, enjoy and think about uh, for for quite a while because there's a lot of good things to sink your teeth into there. Uh, we'll let you know about our next conversation. Uh, our next conversation is about a, a another significant book that has come out uh, this in the past few months, the rise and fall of dispensationalism: how the evangelical battle over the end times shaped a nation. Uh, many of us only think of dispensationalism as a belief uh, uh, within a certain group of churches, but actually it's one that has actually had a profound shaping influence on a number of different trends in our culture. And uh, Dan Hummel, uh, who's a historian, explores some of those things and how that's shaped the larger cultural imagination of America. He works as a historian of U.S. history uh, of U.S. religion. He has written Covenant Brothers, Evangelicals, Jews, and the U.S.-Israeli Relations. And uh, Dan works at a study center called Upper House, uh, located at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, so he's very much in the mix of the university world. So uh, that, that conversation is going to be on October 5th, 2023 at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And you have the link for signing up in the registration, and we hope you'll come back and join us. Uh, finally, I want to just say thank you, uh, first of all, uh, to Paul for taking the time to join us today and to be part of this conversation. I also uh, want to thank InterVarsity Press. Uh, InterVarsity Press has been a great partner in setting up and ho uh, these conversations and uh, offering books at a discount, and so we uh, want to express our appreciation for their work. Uh, the conversation was brought, and we want to thank you for being a part of the conversation, for being with us today, for uh, raising your questions and comments as well. Uh, we, If you're not already a member of the Emerging Scholars Network, we invite you to join for free at blog.emergingscholars.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ESNIBCF. And uh, visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, this recording will be up probably in the next 24 hours on the YouTube channel. So you can tell your friends uh, if, if they weren't able to come and join uh, uh, to be on it. And uh, there are about 48 other recordings on that channel uh, on a variety of topics uh, that uh, we've done over the last several years. So uh, please uh, go and visit and subscribe to keep up to date on the latest things that we've posted there. So with that, thank you very much uh, for uh, being with us today. Uh, we're going to end our recording.